The Hardy Boys is a long-running series of adventure mystery novels aimed at 10 to 14 year old boys, but that doesn't mean I can't look at them with an older eye and pull them apart and rate them. Why am I qualified? They were some of my favourite books when I was a kid, and now, as I reread them more than 5 years since the last time I picked one up, will they hold up? Welcome to Ranking the Hodies, the series where I rank every single Hody Boys book ever made. The first novel in the Hody Boys series, and the first one that we will cover in a ranking of the novels, is The Tower Treasure. It was originally written in 1927 by Leslie McFarlane under the pseudonym Franklin W. Dixon, as all Hody Boy books were regardless of actual author. It was written by the Stratmeyer Syndicate and was published by Gorsett and Dunlap. The version I'm looking at today is the 1959 rewrite of the book, also titled The Tower Treasure, but with a slightly different plot, mostly involving Update 2, as the back of the front page says, The Detective Methods. There was also a shortening of the book and a condensation of how quickly some of the clues were figured out and put together. In the future, depending on if I can find the original editions of the early Hardy Boys novels, we can potentially look at them as well. Before we get into the book, I'm going to quickly go over how the ranking system works. To help rank the books based on more than personal preference, I will be looking at five key categories. Strength of the mystery, strength of side characters, the Hody's friends, logic of the mystery and clues, and realness of the novel. Each category can have a maximum score of 10 points for a total maximum score before bonuses of 50. Strength of the mystery refers to how well knit the plot is and if it is a strong mystery to solve or a weak one. This can be affected by the type of case, the time to solve the case, and how they solve the case. Strength of side characters refers to the side characters the Hodies meet. Are they a little more than set dressing, or do they have personality and a purpose to the story? This rating does not include the strength of the Hodies' gang of friends. The third ranking is the Hodies' friends, and it looks at if, who, and how the various chums of the Hody boys are used. Between their girlfriends and school buddies, they have a strong support system that in the best stories are usually well utilized with at least some having key roles in the novel. The logic of the mystery and clues is related to the strength of the mystery, but focuses on if a reader can put the clues together themselves if faced with the same mystery in real life or if the book is required because logical leaps or unlikely coincidences abound in the novel. Finally, the realness of the novel examines if the novel is realistic. Is it possible that the Hody Boys, in this state the book has them in, in this case high school students, could solve the mystery? This looks at the reasons given for having the time to travel to Sleuth, and if the novel's mystery is realistic. As well, bonus points can be awarded for things such as appearance of recurring and amusing side characters, the usage of Chet's hobbies as a plot point. I will also make sure to point out my favorite quote in the book. So with the ranking methodology cleared up, let's dive into the very first Hardy Boys novel, The Tower Treasure. And warning, spoilers ahead, though you can skip to the time below to avoid them. The Tower Treasure has a relatively simple plot, focusing on a robbery of gems and bonds from the safe of Mr. Hood Applegate and his sister Adelia, who own the Tiddler Tower Mansion, one of the skyline buildings of the small town of Bayport, where the Hardys live. The Hardy boy's dad, Fenton Hardy, is brought in to help solve the case and recover the stolen valuables, and enlists his son's help. The Hardy boys are already somewhat involved, as at the start of the novel, before the theft, they were delivering a paper for their father, and were almost run over by a reckless driver, who then potentially stole their buddy Chet's jalopy. The Hardy Boys discover a grey wig on the barn floor at Chet's when the thief comes back to steal the spare tire for the car and bring it to their dad. They check various wig shops, but don't have any luck finding an owner. The case progresses, with Mr. Applegate having his butler arrested and his family removed from the property, after which they move into a small house in a bad part of town. The boys use their friends, Biff, Jerry, Phil, and Tony, to help search around Bayport and the surrounding areas, but don't find anything. On a picnic lunch at a spot suggested by their dad, Joe stumbles upon an old tire that Chet confirms is his. Some more searching by the friends finds the missing car, but no other apparent clues. Later, when they go back, they find an old jacket and hat with some red strands of hair in it, which potentially match what the reckless driver and car thief from earlier were wearing. Their father helps them find where it came from, and flies to New York to look into it. The Hardy Boys themselves are later invited to New York, and they search around, finding the manufacturer of the wig, and then the owner of the wig, a Shakespearean actor who claims that his wig was stolen along with his watch and a ring. 
They are quickly able to claim from the theft, however, the play he is in was ongoing at the time of the robbery. Before they head back home, they drop by the New York Police Headquarters, where Mr. Hardy accesses the files and finds some potential suspects, all of whom they quickly clear except for Mr. John Jackie, aka Red Jackley, for his affinity for Red Wig. The Hardy boys head back while their dad stays in town and continue to look for clues in Bayport. A few days later, their dad returns home and lets them in on the news that Red Jackley has been caught, but is going to die soon because of an accident during his attempted escape from police after a different jewel robbery. But right now, nobody can talk to him because of his condition. A few days quietly pass, and then Mr. Hardy gets the word that he can go and talk to Jackley. However, Detective Smuff, a rather bumbling detective, also plans on interviewing Jackley, which Mr. Hardy says will make him clam up as fast as anything in the world. The boys interrupt him and allow their dad to arrive early and collect the confession that he did it and give a loosely worded hint to where the treasure is in It's in the Old Tower. From there, the Hardy boys have to find the treasure. That is the tower treasure. How does it do? For strength of mystery, it is a pretty light mystery, which makes sense for the first outing of the Hardy Boys, as it has to do a lot of work in terms of introducing the characters and the town of Bayport and how the book series works. The plot, however, is well put together and works well. So for this series, I'm going to give it a pretty high mark. Let's say 8. The side characters in this book consist of the Applegates, Detective Oscar Smuff, the actor Harold Morley, the Robinson family, and Hobo Johnny, as well as an assortment of shop owners, old railway men, and random passerbyers. The Applegates are wonderfully eccentric, with Hoda a stamp collector, and his sister a woman who dresses in many conflicting colors and designs. Though portrayed as reclusive and somewhat gruff, they are at heart good and an enjoyable part of the story. Oscar Smuff is Oscar Smuff, a bubbling idiot who desperately wants to be on the Bayport police force, and like we will see in the future, books makes a lot of mistakes. But this is okay, and I still love him, silliness and all. Sadly, Aunt Gertrude is not in this novel, and this will cost them marks, as she is always a delight with her worries for the boy's safety and general presence in the books she is in. Together, the side characters get a mark right in the middle, as they are neither particularly memorable, except for Smuff, but not bad either. But some marks have to be taken off and go to the mysterious absence. 6. The Hardy Boys' friends all make their first appearance in this book with Chet, Tony, Phil, Jerry, Iowa, and Callie all making their debut. They are all very loosely characterized, mostly in a few lines, but again, as the first book, the characters have room to grow. But they aren't used very much in this book, mostly as attendees at a party and the male friends as people to help find the jalopy. So here, the characters get a low medium mark. We're going to give it a 6 as well. The logic of the mysteries and clues is all there. If all a bit run by the coincidence that it was Chet's car that was stolen by the same person who committed the tower heist, and because they found the car, they found a wealth of other clues. The likelihood of a red wig wearing thief, and a thief who wears red wigs being recently released is a bit of a quincy doink, but potentially one necessary for the plot. Altogether, this also gets a six. Finally, realism. This book is fairly realistic, with the boys having to go to their professional detective father for advice and help figuring out clues, making sense as this is their debut case. They are also constrained by school and have to do their sleuthing before and after school, as well as on weekends. The only potential flaw here is that the trip to New York happens, but this could be on a weekend. It is also likely something that two teenagers, 17 and 18, could and wouldn't be allowed to solve. As well, the theft and how it was pulled off are reasonably logical, even if all the details aren't spelled out. This gets a 9. My favorite quote in the book belongs to an old railway man the boys come across later in the novel. The quote? I make it a rule to memorize every face I see in the newspapers, never know when there's gonna be an accident, and I might be called on to identify some people. Dirk, quirky, and a little unsettling. The perfect trio. Bonus point. Together, these scores add to 35. There's only one bonus point awarded for the tower treasure for the quote. There were no other points, as Chet does not have a hobby that ties into the plot, and this is the first occurrence of all reoccurring side characters. This puts the tower treasure in first place. Next up, the house on the cliff. Will the Hody Boys' second mystery outshine the first, or is it doomed to be in second place? Thanks for watching, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I've got book reviews, analysis, and rankings multiple times a week. Leave a like and your thoughts on the tower treasure, or suggestions for the next book to review or analyze down below in the comments. Until next time, keep sleuthing!